Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Kansas City Startup Grind, uh, our first inaugural session, and I want to thank you for being here. Today's session is about diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and how to incorporate DE&I into your culture, in your organization, from day one, instead of maybe down the road when it's too late. And our speakers today, Tanita Mullen and Zoe Moore, are uh, well-versed in this subject matter, and they're going to help us understand how to incorporate DE&I into our organization. Though I just want to give a shout out to um, both Zoe Moore and Dakota Shade and thank them for their service, both uh, veterans of uh, public service. So my heart goes out to both of you. Um, this is Startup Grind, and it is the world's largest community of startups, founders, innovators, and creators. And Startup Grind has a very wide reach. We reach over 3.5 million people in over 600 chapters. Um, in uh, 125 countries around the world. And our values are about helping others before we help ourselves, giving back to the community and making friends. That's what Startup Grind really is all about, making those connections and those friends in that entrepreneurial innovator world. And so I'm just really thrilled today to ask uh, Zoe and Tanita um, to be here to talk about this really important subject for all of the entrepreneurs and um, innovators out there. So this is a quick bio for both Tanita and Zoe. And again, I just want to uh, congratulate both of them. They recently won a prestigious President's Chair Award at uh, Meeting Professionals International's Regional Conference, or I'm sorry, Global Conference, um, in Grapevine, Texas recently. So thank you and ladies, welcome. Zoe, it's so good to see you. And Tanita, I'm sorry we can't see you. I know you're having some technical difficulties with your camera, but um, welcome. And I will we'll talk a little bit about um, what you guys are doing. And I think one of the things we discussed when we first met was looking at the three pillars of DE&I and how, if you really don't know where to start or what to do, this is the perfect place to do that. So um, Zoe, if you'd like to start and then uh, Tanita, and then we'll have our conversation. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I always call myself a startup, you know, as an entrepreneur. So I'm so happy to support you, Carolyn, and be a part of this, uh, you know, opportunity to speak to other entrepreneurs in, in the startup phase. You know, as you said, we just won this award for 2020 Chair Award for Meeting Professionals International, and it it's recognition of the hard work uh, that ensued this year. You know, we started as co-chairs in January, actually back in December when we first were brought on. And we were in a startup mode, really, you know, with members that we had never met, but a mandate that said, hey, you know, we need you to uh, inspire more leaders to, you know, do diversity, equity and inclusion or to bring more resources to chapter leaders across 70 plus chapters. And in clarifying that message is what got us to the pillars, you know, and the pillars really allowed us to structure how to communicate to the to the committee what we were trying to do. And I think without those pillars, I would say we would have not had a roadmap. So really in working with Tanita, what we've come to over the last 10 months now, now 11 months, time flies, is that what does it mean for us to be strategically committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion? And that's my favorite conversation to have. Well, that is great. Welcome. Um, Tanita, would you like to add anything to that before we dive in? Um, no, I think Zoe pretty much said it best. Um, you know, sometimes when you're new. Um, I apologize. Go ahead. When, sometimes when you're starting something new, you um, have to kind of pull back and start from scratch and try to really um, create kind of a roadmap. And so um, the biggest thing that we hope to um, provide you today is just kind of an insight of how we started from scratch and just um, quickly came up with some type of 
roadmap so that um, we can begin doing some of the work. That's great. And uh, one of the things I know we've talked about this. So as we go through this, um, I will just say that there's a proactive and a reactive approach. And then there's a closed and an open approach. And as uncomfortable as these conversations are or this process can be, um, you have to be able to lean into it. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, I think the, the difference between, you know, as we do these different webinars and talk to different leaders across the country is DI training or, you know, DI is not new. And there's a lot of people who have kind of lost hope in it actually making changes in organiz organizations and companies. So what I found in this time and why we really stress um, being strategically committed, you know, speaks to our title. If you are, if you don't assess now in the beginning, then you'll be assessed, right? So if you are not proactive and you're reactive, you'll you'll feel that from public perception. You'll feel that amongst your team. Um, and I and I heard someone say yesterday, her name is Bonnie Smith from Studio B Entertainment, and she said, without a DEI strategy in place, you don't have a growth strategy. And so we talk less about unconscious bias training and defining terminologies. While those will always be important, we believe that the work uh, starts with people, you know, you know, analyzing themselves, learning those terms. But when it's time to have the conversation that we're ready to have, we're after the conversation. We're after the dialogue, and we're asking leaders, "What are you doing um, in your business that's going to be measurable and sustainable?" And so. That's the conversation that makes and that ensures that you're not reactive because you're being strategic. You're thinking ahead and you're not looking at DEI just from the moral aspect, getting people to like you or um, people doing better within the workplace. Yes, that's a part of it. But the strategy is what ensures that it's it's mandated and standardized um, in, in the workplace culture. So, that to me, therein lies a difference. And that's why we say the title to, to assess ahead of time, assess what you need to do before you, you go down the road of being reactive to um, just dealing with all kinds of issues that come from not creating a culture of belonging. But uh, Tanita, well, definitely, I think another thing that comes to mind with, um, you know, our experience going back to the pillars, you know, I think there was a feeling amongst us, you know, the the mandate or the mission of DEI um, sometimes gets very broad for people. And, and what strategy really did for us is, in a sense, narrow our focus. It allowed us to compartmentalize objectives uh, and key results. So we split up, you know, our strategy between the need for research, uh, the need for resources and structure. And I think all of those are relevant to startups, right? Research really encourages uh, leaders and their team to both internally and externally conduct market research, find out who your target audience is or who you're trying to reach. And then also internally, if you have that representation that matches the market that you're trying to reach, or the markets that you should be reaching with your products or services. Um, there's more studies that are, are coming out that are finding that a lot of products and services are not um, you know, in compliance with ADA and the, the Americans Disability Act, or even in a compassionate way, considering what that experience is for someone with different abilities, right? And then now when we talk about all the social identifiers across dimensions of diversity, if your products and services are offensive to different groups, whether it be LGBTQ or um, by race mm -hmm. or culture or religion, when you have representation in your company um, to reach a target audience, then you're getting checked. You're getting, you know, you have in, in checks and balances within your team to make sure things aren't released that are excluding certain groups that are, uh, forgetting that there, you know, that everyone isn't the same, you know, that everyone has different perspectives and different ways of engaging 
uh, with whatever a startup is bringing out, whether it be tech, whether it be, you know, um, food products, whether it be destinations, uh, whatever, whatever that startup is leading, that if you're thinking from full spectrum or across the spectrum, your product will actually do better. And there are studies to support that just as much as there are studies to support if you have diverse representation across all dimensions of diversity, that your team will perform better. A better right. performing team leads to more revenue. So, you know. Right. Well, let's get into those pillars and mm -hmm. let's uh, talk about that a little bit. Yeah. And Tita, welcome back. <laughs> I'm hoping your technology is okay, that we can hear you. Yeah, so oh, perfect. talking about the pillars, so we, I know probably spoke to this already, but we really had to kind of regroup inside um, the many people who we were responsible for really uh, kind of leading um, this year. And so we really had to take a step back and just structure, structurally come up with something that was going to work for at least the next 12 months. And um, so re we came up with some pillars and they really revolve around research st structure and research. So do you want to advance the slide? Sure. Oh yeah, definitely can. Great. And while you do that, I just want to say uh, welcome to Lakeisha Harrison. Uh, she is with Startup Grind and is a chapter director in one of our chapters. And uh, welcome to Shannon. I have put everybody in presenter mode. We're a small, intimate group, so it'd be great to just for everyone to see each other and interact. So uh, welcome to both Shannon and Tanita. And then, uh, yeah, let's get into those pillars. So pillars of information, research, structure, and resources. That really is, let's start right here. Right. Well, you know, when we're, I think Tanita is still on. When we, you know, talked about our research, uh, the first pillar, we were encouraging um, the, the organization, which is Meeting Professionals International, to assess, uh, assess their members, uh, assess their, you know, future members um, and even past to identify down demographics who they are, you know, um, sex, sexual orientation, gender, uh, culture, religion. And the, the conversation that comes up when you're um, presenting those questions out to a membership body was people's hesitation to respond to those questions. They, they really wanted to know, um, you know, why are you getting so personal? And even in the past, those responses have been um, kind of negative in, in their response. You know, it was more along the lines of, you know, I don't have to answer these questions and I see what you're trying to do. And so what our committee came up with was a statement. And I think Tanita can speak to that statement that we worked with um, their, their research team to develop. Yeah, I um, came up with a statement. Uh, it was really just the em embodiment of like what the committee was looking to. It was um, kind of like when we talked about MAP, it was kind of the thing that would just people would make decisions on whether or not they wanted to get involved or um, it was something that could be changed based on um, committee to committee from group to group. And so, and, and I know we talked about this before, but one of the things that I, all I hear often is, you know, people say, we need to do this work because it's the right thing to do, right? And I think it being the right thing to do is just not enough to sustain the long-term commitment because life happens and other world events happen. And so you really have to make, um, a, you really have to do research before you start to get soft on why you're doing this work so that it's not just, you know, you're not just living on the platform of it's the right thing, right? You know, you have to move from that platform to, okay, how, how many people do we have in our work? What are the type of customers that we want to serve? Where do they live? How do we get access to them? Um, now I'll have is in that research pillar. Yeah, definitely. Um, then, well, oh, I'm sorry. It was, so one of our favorite mm -hmm. sayings is 
you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And that research helps you get there. Right. I also found that, you know, data collection for me uh, strengthened my ability to articulate what the change that I wanted to see, because if not, I was operating in my emotions, right? And and what I mean by that is, you know, when you first tell somebody, hey, there is lack of, you know, black professionals in your leadership, there's lack of transgender leaders in your in your leadership, there's lack of this, people are gonna respond in a way, either they're gonna say, well, we have that one person, or there's nobody who's talented enough, or we don't even know where to reach out to that group. And that response is a, a defense mechanism that I think a lot of people come up with. But when you present numbers and 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 show people that th there's an opportunity with this challenge, you haven't had any diversity over the last five years. You've had 85% males, 15% women. And the goal or the objective that we want to set with that pillar, and that's where you know our pillars took us, is we want to change that that setup where it's no longer 85% or 15% in balance we want to move direction of 50-50 we want to have or we want to have representation of every group at 10 to 15% it may seem like an ambitious goal but having that objective with each pillar starting with research helped us then really line out those key results. What did we have to do? And we have three results under three key results under each pillar um, that will get us to that objective of once we know our members, what are we going to do with that information? We're going to serve them better. We're going to bring out better content. We're going to identify that different regions, because this is chapters across you know, the nation, 70 plus chapters or and international, both in, in Asia and Europe, and they have different needs. So that in, with that information and, and using that statement, we informed you know, members how we're gonna use it to better serve them. And so data establishes a benchmark and from that benchmark, you can grow and, and set you know, uh, you know, attainable goals. That's cool. right. And then, so, oh, I was going to say, Tanita, um, on on that, what did you find in the research that really stood out? Yeah, I think for us, um, one of the things that we found out, um, and and this is like before and during our our leadership term, is that um, the structure how these things were being handled um, were what needed to be kind of um, reimagined and um, oh. like really hard data as far as like numbers and things like that um, or, or you know who's in the organization and where are they from we didn't really have that information so in that research we also discovered that it isn't very important for this particular organization that we were working with that they start to work with them for this kind of data research, for this type of um, information. So two things. Number one, the structure of how um, these things were being handled probably should be reimagined. And then the second thing was that we don't really have a lot of data. We don't really have a lot of information that we need to make um, some long-term choices. And so that, that became, our research pillar actually became um, researching researchers <laughs> to be Right. Well, and you just nailed it right on the head because mm -hmm. it's 10 years down the road into your organization, if you don't have the research and the data, you can't create a structure. So the beauty of doing this at the very beginning is to have that baseline and foundation. It, you know, it seems very simple, yeah. right? Yeah, I think too. So, you know, we can talk all day about the data and research basically to tell leadership, you know, here are the changes we want to make. These are the goals that we have. But in doing that, you know, we found that, okay, once the data is had, who's going to utilize it and, and who's going to make those decisions? And so the second pillar was structure, like really looking. And I think this is key for startups where in, you have the privilege, if you would, or the luxury at the very beginning to determine what your structure is gonna look like. Now, you did mention in the beginning that Dakota and I both have military backgrounds. So we're very used to structure processes and <laughs> procedures. And 
I, I see it sometimes in the corporate or in some of these organizations in, in corporate America and uh, that that structure sometimes can be a little loose, but I now miss the chain of command. I miss knowing, you know, mm. where this, inf how information travels, right? Or how things are managed or handled because as much as we build these teams and we assume well, everybody's going to handle it. Or we have a group of leaders that are focused on, you know, these three aspects. If structurally there is no one committed to DEI, then that research that can help us improve as a business uh, right. gets stuck in a file cabinet somewhere because there's no one to lead that initiative. So our structure um, pillar really spoke to, hey, there's a lot of silos going on within the organization we need to bring that all under one leader and then create an information channel where, you know, once we get the data in, who does it get reported to? And then what are we, how are we going to either disseminate this information or how are we going to put it into, into practice? You know, um, if, if it's an educational thing, if people are saying there's barriers, say socioeconomic, the cost of, you know, getting education or getting a certification, does that go to the education committee? Is there someone leading education who's gonna handle that, mull over that information and then make some changes according to what the data says, right? And so that was a pillar that came from, you know, basically how, you know, um, information would travel and how things were gonna get done. So that was the, the section, the, the second pillar and, I, I think that's really key part of any organization. I want to add to what's and please this. I'm really big about um, succession planning, and especially for your business, you might open up a different location. You might, you know, open up an office across the country. You want to make sure that if someone had to take this same model and do this on, you know, a different coast or in a different location that they can build their team or they can start to infuse the, the DEI strategy into the business, even if you are not involved. And so that is the most important thing I think about structure is people need to be able to see with or without you how this plan is supposed to be executed. Yeah. And, you know, again, I just, I, I, Love and I again. It's Veterans Day was yesterday, but I'm just remembering things that I took for granted when I was in the military. You know, we have a, a overall formation, which is say your company, and in in a formation, we're split up typically into four different um, ranks, right? And that rank is led by someone, and they're responsible for one aspect of the mission. And then when you have meetings or you have formation, each person who's leading you know, a particular area or a rank reports into the the overall leader, the one who's leading the formation. And just now reflecting back on that process of how smooth that ran, you know, we're right. all contributing to the mission, but when the structure is established from the very beginning, which is something that all startups should do, not taking it for granted, uh, you know, in the beginning, I know <clears throat> as a startup person, or founder, CEO, all those different titles we give ourselves, <clears throat> excuse me, that we wear many hats. You know, we, uh, we're doing the finance, we're doing the marketing, we're doing everything. But you still, <clears throat> from the very beginning, want to establish um, what the job description is in those roles. And committing to DEI in the very beginning, maybe in your HR, in um, your business development, but embedding it into your core strategy structurally is what's going to set you up for success. That it's not ancillary to your business and it's not an afterthought. That in everything that you do, if you start it with HR, if you start it with business development, you you have according, you know, associated with those job descriptions, what it means for that person to adhere to your DEI policies, whether that's the fair treatment of people and pay and how you market your business and your values, that it's really integrated into your structure in a way that everybody is engaging uh, with being equitable and inclusive. Well, and that leads me um, something we had talked about previously, 
it's it has to be sustained. Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes to investment, you know, a monetary investment, I think that, yes, it can be expensive, but it can also be more expensive if you don't do it from the beginning. Absolutely. Uh, you know, what do they, I know they say all press is good press. Or so they say like if something happens, but I, I, I would say trying to react to a problem, trying to fix a problem is expensive. It's right. expensive, not just monetary. It's expensive for perception and it's expensive trying to just clean up the, the culture, you know, the, the mistrust the, when people are not right. optimized, you know, yeah, it, it gets really expensive. Uh, so spend the money up front and do it right or incorporate it, you know, from the beginning so that you have that there. Right. And the structure too, right? Because that's really what's going to sustain culture and the DE&I over the long run. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, yeah. then the final pillar resources. And I, Perfect. I think everything that every pillar is it both happens internally and externally, right? And so internally, when we, our mandate or our goal was to uh, keep chapter leaders or keep, you know, uh, people who are responsible in a, in a certain city informed about our DEI values or our accomplishments, they needed to be able to go on a website and find that information, find out what the organization is doing in regard or their commitment to DEI. So just like with the, the statements that came out across social media, that was put on our equality and justice resource page. But in, in beyond the statement, there was what books to read, what movies to watch, what articles, uh, the research that, you know, that was being conducted. Here were links for people to uh, go one place, collated information in one place for them to sit for, you know, 10, 15 minutes, maybe an hour and stay abreast on information and, and know how to, where to start to do the work. That was important internally. Um, so Tanita, when it comes to resources, what would you tell a entrepreneur or a new CEO to do or to have at hand? What resources would be good resources for me to have to help push that culture into my organization? Yeah, I think from an external perspective, you want to have resources that people um, can pull from if they are writing about you, if they are researching you, um, if they want to partner with you. So those type of things, you know, in this time today, it, it might need to be what is your view or your standpoint or your statement on racial injustice? Like we, you know, people are checking for those type of things right now. And um, I think that's something that's not going to stop. So those types of statements, you know, what is your core value around diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, I, I see a lot of places have like the statement, you know, the, the HR statement, the one that you put on the application, right? That's not going to work. It needs to be a little bit more personal. It's being, it needs to be a little bit um, more, um, related to the core of your business and not something that you just pulled out of like a book, right? Um, I think um, you also need to, <laughs> this isn't necessarily a resource, right? But people are looking at your website and your business as a resource. They're trying to figure out if they want to work with you. They want to figure out if are you aligned with their mission? So, you know, you probably should have some kind of visual aspects where people know like, hey, we we hire um, a diverse group of people. We, we um, that's, you can see that in our board. You can see that in who we have in, in, in our marketing and how we're pushing out our message and some of our um, print and, and, and online pieces. So that's the external piece. And we could probably go down that road even further. In terms yeah. of thing, you know, you want to have, you want your employees and your people that work for work with you to be able to understand where you stand. What are your policies um, when it comes to hiring, when it comes to um, disciplinary action? Um and what and for us, particularly with the organization that is membership based, the members really needed to find resources that they could use in their chapters. So if you are a franchise or something like that, you want to find you want to have resources that people in your network can use, you know, whether it's signage, whether it's um stock photography or whatever it is that can say and visually show 
hey, we are serious about this and, you know, we want to give our partners um, access to some of those things so that they can say that they can have the same message as us, no matter if they're um, franchise, mm -hmm. if they're, um, you know, a sister property or something like that. Yeah, I think that's key. I, you know, we, we do another webinar, which is also part of our resources. And I think with that webinar, the, the goal into 2021 is we bring in people that you may not have the opportunity to always talk to. So now partners are getting to see, um, in this member organization are getting to see and talk to people that they may not cross paths with. You know, and then in these discussions, the questions that they may want to ask these individuals are being asked and we're having these real conversations. It's literally called real talk so that we can really break down diversity, equity and inclusion and and see what a company is doing beyond the words on a page, you know, talking to the leadership, talking to people that are involved with moving the, the company forward. So. I guess that's an additional idea for some of, you know, startups or anybody involved is, you know, there's not enough time in the day to have a whole bunch of meetings, but you can record a video and, you know, just like we see these raw videos on IGTV, it, we don't take for granted that opportunity to provide a resource by just talking to people like, you know, a, a video, a vlog of some sort to, to share you know, what's happening with the company, what your views and values are so that people can hear it as well and then point them in to books and, and videos that you watch, you know, so that they know that, you know, the fabric of the company um, as additional resources. So just a list of resources was our third pillar. I love add to what Well, and then, oh, sorry, go ahead, Tanita. Really quickly, I want to add to this and I know what I, was important for us to get some Q&A time in. But the beauty of you having those public conversations is that it, number one, it shows that you're always learning, right? And you are committed because you are putting yourself out there. But it, it, it brings your customer base closer to you when they can see that you are hosting conversation and they can see someone from your company on the phone or on the video, on a video with um, someone that aligns with the direction that you're trying to go. And I just, I feel like it's basically, you know, your customer base watching you evolve and mm -hmm. it might be scary, but it really brings people closer to you, in my opinion. Yeah. And I, I think our pillars also just as, as a kind of a wrap up of it speaks to the overall DEI strategy. You know, because we want to see the organization grow. So while we compartmentalize these three areas, they're all very much interrelated, which you can see, you know, research supports improving the structure. And as we're improving the structure and others are wanting to use that roadmap, we provide the resources of how they could get there as well. Yeah, that is um, perfect because you you don't know where to start so start figuring out where you're at you don't know what you don't know figure out what you don't know then how do i get there and then how do i help others get there as well you know um and then sustainability maybe just for a couple of minutes before we open up to q a what do you think the one thing is that you know entrepreneurs might need to do because as you grow your organization you have more people you know culture can change a little bit what's that sustainability piece and is that part of the resources or do you revisit your structure to make sure it's still there uh, oh, well, you're... <laughs> no go ahead tanita <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll just say really quick as zoe probably will agree um you should always be, we, this year, as us working together, we were revisiting things on a weekly basis. And oh, oh. as we, there were, there were things happening with um, COVID-19 and with, um, you know, all the racial injustice that was happening throughout the different, throughout the country, we had to pivot very quick. Um, and I think you should not be afraid of that. And I'm actually curious to see yeah, I, I would say you, 
you're you should always be rewriting, reevaluating all the time, right? And you know, there's going to be a lot of information out there, and that's kind of why we put this quote out there. It's you 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 learn by applying it, right? You have to right this information to work you know bring it down from pie in the sky to actually implementing it into what you're doing and that's why things get re rewritten because you learn okay this this resource didn't work or maybe data presented in that way or you know collecting data in that way didn't work so let's try it this way you know it's it's like I'm just reminded of elementary school uh, science project, the hypotheses, right? That's what you're you're doing in business is you're with DEI as well. We want to serve all groups. We want to do better at this uh, particular service or product, but we're learning. And, and that's part of being very transparent with the people that you're serving and that you're working with. We don't have all the answers. And so we're constantly doing the research. We're constantly revisiting our structure and we're constantly showing you what we're doing uh, to apply these things. And if you have any insight, we welcome it. We invite it in um, as we rework that plan. No, that is, that's great. And I do think that it's something that should stay on the radar of every leader. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not something you can fix and check the box and say, I did this. Now let me find something else. Okay. Right. It has to be a constant thing. Um, let's open it up to questions. We have uh, Lakeisha and then uh, Dakota. I don't know if either of you, you know, want to ask Zoe or Tanita anything, but um, please let us know. We can put it into the chat or um, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Um, so I wasn't really planning on being <laughs> in the discussion, <laughs> uh, but that's cool. Um, but no, that I, I don't have a question, just a comment. You know, I, I think everything the lady said, the ladies said were, were on point. Um, because, uh, what I'm finding even within our own organization is that if, um, if diversity, equity, or inclusion is not part of your core, um, you know, values when you start um, and you just assume that people are doing it, it's very hard to go back and like try to change and shift that culture. Um, so I think that advice, you know, for as founders, excuse me, that we need to always um, have these things in mind because you're right. We are everything in the beginning. We, we learn all parts of our startup or our business, and then we start to hand off those things to others. And so it's hard to hand off a culture that is inclusive, it's equitable, it's diverse when um, it, it isn't part of the culture when you first come in. So um, I yeah. just think what you guys have been saying has been like absolutely on point and, and especially being data driven um, is really, really important. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I, I'll keep, maybe because it's Veterans Day just passed, but I'll keep touching back on, I remember, uh, and I wonder if Dakota could jump in there too, but something that's not normal in the military is when we, you know, first uh, like group up or meet up, no one's really checking on like, how are you doing? Truth. Yeah. Oh, I think we lost Zoe. Um, just to kind of go on that until she comes back. We have a workshop in our organization called Beyond the Badge. Um, when you're thinking about the attendees that come to your event, you know, you get a name badge. And to her point, a lot of times you're pigeonholed in that place of this is my name, this is my company, this is uh, my title. And what we find is if you actually dig a little bit deeper into who the individuals are who are attending your event, you learn more about them and what their needs are and then how you can uh, bring that back to the event so that you better serve that customer. And so I, I, it's, it's very much the same thing. To your point, Zoe, 
<laughs> right now in the army, you're a number and they're putting you in a slot and they're putting you somewhere, right? But yeah. over time, they then get to understand what kind of a person you are, what your character is, what you're capable of as a soldier. And that sort of moves you through that system and they get to know you. And that yeah. is huge. Yeah, I don't I don't know where I froze, but you you picked it up and carried it on perfectly, right? Because we you and I are building a team right now. And we established yeah. a culture from the very beginning that when Carolyn raises her right eyebrow up, oh, that means Carolyn needs coffee. So it's like, you know, being paying attention to those signals and signs. I mean, that's a small little anecdotal thing, but really being mindful of who the people that you're working with and establishing that from the very beginning creates this culture so that when new people are added to the team, they're observing that. You almost don't even have to tell them that it's important that we know who you are because you're a value add. And so if if you truly believe that new people on your team or leaders and, and up and down the chain are value adds, you'll realize that getting to know them is nothing. It's a lot of people think that it's soft and it's mushy. Um, no, it's actually, it, it aids to productivity and efficiency because if somebody doesn't learn in a particular way and you're giving them information because that's the way that you receive information and they're not actually receiving it, now it's slowing down their productivity, you know, versus if you get to know how they learn, give the information the way that they receive it, we can, we can get this mission done. Right. And, you know, that actually makes a, a completely different subject, but helps build that emotional intelligence and makes you a better leader. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. In the organization. Yeah. Um, we are we've got a few minutes left. Uh, any last thoughts uh, from both Zoe and Tanita? And we'll end our session today. This has been great. Um, yeah. Well, I, you know, go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> go I, ahead I Tanita. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to leave you with, um, you know, I'm, I won't reiterate what we've been saying, but I will say this today, um, you know, get a piece of paper out and just write down your fears as it relates to tackling this, um, the, the, the subject of diversity, equity, inclusion. You have to get out first. I noticed doing, you know, working with Zoe this year and having many conversations that there's a fear that I'm going to do something wrong, that, you know, it's not the right thing or, you know, and I want to address those fears so that you can really step over those and get to the, and that's the one thing, the action item that I will say um, is important for you to do before you start any of the things that we talked about. Yeah, I'll add to that. I think that's perfect. And I be curious. That's how you overcome the fear. When somebody presents you something that you're unfamiliar with, for example, pronouns. I wasn't used to putting my pronouns behind my name. And I didn't know what my position was on pronouns or how I felt or what the origins was, right? And uh, now what I did was research it. I went to go read about it and read the different uh, opinions and, and perspectives on this so that I could truly form my own and really understand uh, why that is respecting someone, right? And so as I have those conversations with people who are now new to uh, pronouns, I don't say, well, you should do it this way. Instead, I say, go read about it, you know? Go, go, go on your yeah. own journey and explore it and overcome that fear that, you know, what it means by learning you know, curiosity. And you have said that to me a couple of times and it has, you know, taken me on a path that I didn't, you know, I found resources, articles, mm -hmm. stories that I don't think I ever would have found had mm -hmm. you not said, Carolyn, go do some research and then come back and ask me the question and I will talk to you about it. So I really appreciated that. And thank you. you. There, there was a, just a quick thing. And I know we only have a few minutes, but uh, one, go watch Social Dilemma. That's, I'll say, watch Social Dilemma. And I think speaking to Tanita's fear, that should make everyone afraid that they're only existing within an echo chamber. The information that you're receiving on social media or on your phone is related to things that you like. So you're receiving news and information 
in mm-hmm. an echo chamber. So you have to intentionally, you know, go learn about transgender community. You have to go learn about um, different cultures and ethnicities, different foods, because if not, you're not going to receive that information. So my phone is confused because I look up all kinds of stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to market to you. Good, because I don't need you to uh, tell me what you think I need to hear. I need to stay curious and, and open to new information. Yeah. Well, that is a great way to end this. Stay curious. And with that, I want to thank Zoe and Tinita both for their time and the information. And um, stay tuned for a new Startup Grind session in December and more information to follow. Ladies and guests, thank you very much for being here this afternoon. Pleasure. Thanks for having us. Hey. Okay, I stopped recording.